All right, hello and welcome to Unit 9, Visual Review. Glad you tuned in. Uh, if you want to print out the same sheets that I'm going to be using on these, they're available in the Review PowerPoints folder. Otherwise, feel free to just watch and learn, or <clears throat> if you prefer, sketch it on your own sheet of paper. <clears throat> so, first of all, we are going to begin at the beginning of Unit 9, dealing with a little thing that we like to call Manifest Destiny. All right, so Manifest Destiny is the main focus of pretty much everything that we're going to be talking about. This is a timeline, and we're dealing with this timeline in three places. We're talking about Texas, we're talking about California, and we're talking about Oregon. All right, so with Manifest Destiny, we really have about five questions that you need to be able to know. <clears throat> Those five questions are, what is it? Why is it? Who went? Uh, where did they go? And what impact? So, to begin here with what is it? Well, a Manifest Destiny is the idea that we should expand from C to Shining Sea or from coast to coast. And it's the idea that this is God's plan for us. Now, why is it so important and why do people go? People go because they believe it will give them a better life. Who goes? We've got a whole bunch of different groups that go. We know we have our, uh, our, our settlers. We have our mountain men who are going there to uh, buy furs. We have uh, people that are going down to Mexico to settle. And then we have the Mormons who are just looking for a little bit of peace and quiet. Where do they go? Well, Manifest Destiny is all about going which way? It's all about going go west, young man. That's right. And the impact. The impact is that by the end of Manifest Destiny, in fact, the United States will have gone from coast to coast. Or as America the Beautiful says, from sea to to shining sea. And that's manifest destiny. And so this idea of manifest destiny causes America to expand, and it causes us to expand primarily in three places. So first of all, we've got two real paths that we need to know about that take us to the where. So first of all is the Santa Fe Trail. And the Santa Fe Trail takes us to Mexico. And then the Oregon Trail. And obviously, the Oregon Trail takes us to Oregon. Trail, trail. All right, so let's focus first on Texas, and then we'll focus uh, on the rest here. So in 1820, Mexico is independent. And so when Mexico becomes independent, they allow all of these American settlers to come in on the Santa Fe Trail. And these American settlers, bring with them certain ideas. And these ideas cause a lot of tensions. And so this is, a, this is an old little dynamite plug type thing. And these tensions are all about culture. So cultural tensions. Things like slavery. Because America allowed it, Mexico did not. Things like democracy. The American settlers wanted it. Mexico didn't have it. Things like religion, things like immigration. All of these ideas create tension between Mexico and the settlers in Texas, and this leads us into war. The war for Texas independence. And we meet people like Davy Crockett at the Alamo. He's a uh, a Tennessean who goes there and he encourages them, and encourages them, and keeps their spirits up. And we also meet uh, Samuel Houston. Samuel Houston is also a man from Tennessee, and he becomes the first president of Texas, the Independent Republic. Now, while this is happening, what's going on in California? Well, not a lot at this point. What's going on in Oregon? Settlers are arriving. Now, these events bring us to something that has an impact on all of this, and that is the uh, presidential election of President 
Dark Horse, Polk. And President Polk runs with the campaign slogan of 54, 40, or fight, meaning that he is going to annex all of Oregon, and he also promises to annex Texas. And along the way, he's also going to pick up California. So the way President Dark Horse Polk does this is he starts a war with Mexico by sending the United States Army into disputed territory. The U.S. Army goes into territory that both Mexico and the United States believe they belong. Mexico feels invaded, so they start this war. And in the Mexican-American War, we also have a smaller conflict called the Bear Flag Revolt going on in California. So at this time, California was part of Mexico, and so the United States encourages a revolt there. And so at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, we sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, it gives the United States, or us, the Mexican Cession. And the Mexican Cession is Texas. The Mexican Cession is California. So we get all of that territory from the Mexican-American War. Let's write that in there, too. All right, now continuing. So not only does he get Texas and California, he also gains control of Oregon. And he does this by negotiating with Britain because it's split. It was split with Britain. And so he negotiates with Britain and he says, well, give us all of it. 5440 is the line of latitude across the top of the Oregon Territory. But instead, Britain says, well, why don't we just split it and you take the bottom half and we'll take the top half. And James K. Polk says, okay. So with that, he has accomplished Manifest Destiny by giving us Texas, by getting us California, the Mexican Cession, as well as getting us Oregon. Now, once we have California, uh, a little shiny something is discovered out there. That's right, they discover gold out there in California. And gold is first discovered in 1848 at John Sutter's Mill. And so it takes a little while for the news about this to spread. But once the news spreads, people rush to California, including the first large group of Asian immigrants, and they rush in 1849, which is why these people become called 49ers. All right, so that brings us from Manifest Destiny into chapter 13, which is all about the division of the United States. And that division is caused by several events, but it's really all about slavery. So really, we're going to talk about about seven different events here. So the first event that we're going to talk about is one question that everyone's asking what to do about California. Because California at this time is ready to become a state because the population had surged during the gold rush. And so there's a lot of uh, argument about this. What do we do with California? How does it work? And so to solve the problem, James K. Polk, no, excuse me, Henry Clay steps in with the Compromise of 1850. And the Compromise of 1850 does a few different things. So this is the North, this is the South. The North gets California as a free state. And they also ban the slave trade in DC. Now, does it ban slavery? No, but it does ban the slave trade. The South, they also get two things. The first thing that the South gets is they get Popular sovereignty in the Mexican session. Popular sovereignty is the idea that a territory can decide for itself whether to allow slavery or not. 
the second thing that the South gets is they get a new fugitive slave law. Now, this new fugitive slave law, this is going to cause a whole lot of problems. But before we get there, who creates the Compromise of 1850? Yeah, okay, so that's Henry Clay, the great compromiser. So this new fugitive slave law causes a whole lot of problems. People get very, very upset about it. And it leads a woman named Harriet Beecher Stowe, so that's Stowe, that's a W, to write a book. And that book is called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so when people are reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, it requires them to think for the first time about what slavery really means. And so they start thinking, oh, well, this is actually, you know, this is, this is pretty bad. That's the chains and whatever. Okay, so this, someone who's enslaved, and they've realized that Slavery is not very good. So these are Northerners. The Northerners read Uncle Tom's Cabin, and they realize that man, slavery's really messed up. Meanwhile, the Southerners down here are pointing their finger at it, and they're saying it's propaganda, or it's all lies. And so this is increasing tension over the issue of slavery. Now, about this same time, we get the Republican Party, which, don't forget, the Republican Party is all about stopping the spread of slavery. All right. So, next question that we have to solve as a nation is, all right, so we talked about what to do about California. Well, we've solved that problem, but now, what about Kansas and Nebraska? because Kansas and Nebraska are now also ready to become states. And so Senator Stephen Douglas comes up with a plan for what to do about this, and his plan is called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed for popular sovereignty in the territories. Now, Kansas and Nebraska are both north of the Missouri Compromise line. So in reality, these two should both be considered free states. But the Southerners aren't being very nice about it. They're not allowing them to become states. So we're having to compromise. So this is created by Stephen Douglas. All right. So because we get the Kansas-Nebraska Act, this means that there's going to be a vote in Kansas about whether or not to allow slavery. As we talked about in class, the only problem with this vote is that it's impossible to tell who actually lives in Kansas and who doesn't. There's no way to prove that you're from there. So what happens is we have people from all over pouring into Kansas to vote. We have people that are pro-slavery, and we have people who are anti slavery as well. And so as these people rush into Kansas, what ends up happening is violence breaks out. A whole bunch of violence, a whole bunch of terrorism, a whole bunch of blood is spilt over this issue, which leads Kansas to be called Bleeding Kansas. Well, because of bleeding Kansas, people are very upset, including one United States senator, and his name is Charles Sumner. And so Charles Sumner stands before the United States Senate, and he gives a speech about the evils of slavery. Evil is, sorry, slavery is evil. Get that, get that backwards. Slavery is evil. And so is Andrew Butler. So he points fingers at another senator and says, hey, this is all your fault. Well, later on, doesn't go so well. Two days later, Charles Sumner is sitting at his desk in the United States Senate. So he's here just doing his thing. And Andrew Butler, remember the guy that he insulted 
Andrew Butler comes up with his cane. Cane. And he comes up behind Charles Sumner, and he proceeds to beat Charles Sumner across the head with his cane. Now, this guy's name is Preston Brooks. And this becomes known as the caning of Charles Sumner. And this is important because the caning of Charles Sumner shows the division in the United States over the issue of slavery. So it's not just people fighting out on the frontier in Kansas. People are also literally fighting in the United States government. Next, this leads us to the Dred Scott versus Sanford Supreme Court case. And the Dred Scott v. Sanford case, Dred Scott is formerly enslaved, and he is suing for his freedom. And the court basically says two things. The court says, one, Dred Scott is property, not a citizen. And because Dred Scott is property and the Constitution protects property, slavery cannot be abolished. And so that creates a whole lot of problems. There's a whole lot of tension. And basically, people don't know what to do because they were hoping to abolish slavery. But now it becomes clear that they might not even have the right to do that. Slavery may be around for a long time. And so people decide to take things into their own hands. And this leads us to John Brown. John Brown leads a raid on Harper's Ferry. So Harper's Ferry had a federal arsenal of weapons and guns, and his goal was to raid the arsenal and start a slave revolt. It does not go so well. He gets inside the arsenal, but he's not able to actually leave. He's surrounded by the United States Army, and so the slave revolt never happens, and instead, John Brown is hanged for his crimes. All of this leads us towards the presidential election of 1860. So in the presidential election of 1860, the election, sorry, the election of 1860 is over one primary issue. The election of 1860 is over the issue of slavery. That's the entire focus. And in the election of 1860, there are four candidates. You need to keep these guys straight. Candidate number one is John Breckinridge. And he is a Southern Democrat. He is pro-slavery. Two is Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is a Northern Democrat, and he is pro-slavery, but really he is pro-popular sovereignty. Three, we have Abe Lincoln. He's a Republican, and he is a critic of slavery. And then finally, we have John Bell. And John Bell is a constitutional union candidate. And he promises keep slavery and keep the peace. And of course, the South does not vote for Abraham Lincoln, but the North does. And so as a result, Abraham Lincoln becomes president of the United States. The South gets upset, and the South secedes from the Union, leading us into the Civil War. So you should see how all of these separate events here all combine to move us towards division in the nation over the issue of 
slavery. So that is how Manifest Destiny leads us to expand, which leads tension over what to do with those territories that leads us into civil war. I hope that was helpful, and I hope that you enjoyed this edition of the Unit 9 Visual Review.